Julius Wesley Becton, Jr., Lieutenant General, uh, United States Army, retired as of August of 1983. Before that, uh, and I commanded a corps at that time, 7th Corps. Before that, I commanded the 1st Cat Division. Now that this person has come back, and he has some remembrance of that division. It's, you may have seen a patch of it, big yellow patch and a horse's head. Uh, and we had painted on the front of our vehicles that we use a, um, a dragon. We wanted to scare anyone who came in contact with us, and it worked. Well, I started in the military as in, in high school, ROTC, uh, JR, <laughs> Civil Air Patrol. I was a a junior in high school, Laura Marion High School in Spurman, Philadelphia, and a fellow named Hap Arnold came out to speak to her class. Hap Arnold was a graduate of the same school many years earlier. And from that time on, uh, it's had a certain meaning to me and others who have graduated. And as a name dropper, I mentioned a few others, Al Haig, as an example, is a graduate of that high school. And if you happen to be in Washington, D.C., Jim Vance on Channel 4 is a graduate of high school. Jim Billington, the librarian of Congress, is a graduate of high school. But we, after Arnold spoke to us, almost the entire football team went down and took the battery test to become pilots, to win our silver wings and gold bars. It so happened that six of us were called on active duty a year later, five went to Florida for basic training. I went to Mississippi. I might add a great place for a young black from suburban Philadelphia to go to in 1944. The, none of us graduated from flight school. Uh, I had a vision problem, did not have 2020. And the reason I got as far as I did when I would walk into an examination room, they had those big charts, which you may have seen, well, you may have read about, great big E, then small letters and small letters. By the time that I was sitting down for about, about a minute, I had that chart memorized. They didn't say, cover your right eye, and I could read that chart frontwards and backwards. Cover the left eye, same thing. But uh, when I got to Biloxi, Mississippi, Keesler Field, they had a new device, a little machine back here. You go into a dark room, they push a button, and it, it flashes up on the screen, on the wall, really. I did not have a chance to see that chart. And I could, would you read that chart? Which line? And that's when they caught me. Chances of commanding and everything from a platoon up to the largest corps in the Army, the Combat Corps in Germany, the Seventh Corps. We did that great job down the Gulf uh, when uh, took off down there. Commanded the 1st Cav Division. Uh, we had some people here at the Fairfax who remember that, one of whom just walked out. I was going to wait till he come back before I mention that. We've had some commanded a combat unit uh, in Vietnam. Uh, Second Squadron, 17th Cavalry, uh, a group that we still have reunions every year. And I left there in 1968. So, a lot of memories in that respect. As far as World War II, my memories aren't that neat because, one, uh, I was in a segregated unit and there created some problems. And one interesting story, which I think you'll find the book that you've read. 31st Division, Dixie Division, by their, their uh, model, their uh, nickname, was on the same island that the 93rd Division was on, an all black division. When they were not fighting the enemy, they were fighting each other. And so that's not one of the things we'd like to talk about.
but that's our history. Fondest memory. Actually, command of any unit brings back fond memories, and if I was fortunate enough to have my family with me, you couldn't ask for anything better than that. Command at Fort Hood, while some people think is, ooh, I enjoyed it. Command at Stuttgart, Germany, where I commanded 7th Corps, the largest corps in the Army. Family was there. We had a super staff, outstanding people. I enjoyed that. And the family, the, uh, our youngsters were there too. I arrived in the military in 44 on active duty okay. when I graduated from high school. I mentioned that I went off to pre-flight school right. and flucked out because I couldn't see. Ended up at infantry officer candidate school. And school started in January of 45. We graduated the 16th of August of 45. The bomb had just been dropped a week, I think a week earlier. And there's all kinds of rumors running around at school. OCS is out, war's over, don't need you guys, etc. None of those were true, but uh, we uh, painted on our little gold bars. And I went off to join the 93rd Division um, in October of 45. The combat that I saw then was I was the 19-year-old second lieutenant in Charlie Company, 369th Infantry Regiment, 93rd Division. And any word, almost use one of four-letter words, any one of the details that came around, a second lieutenant, 19-year-old, got it. One of which was to take a squad of riflemen and a Japanese translator up into the high ground in a place called Moritai to announce that the war is over because they're hiding out, uh, been over for some time, and all we got was shots fired at us. We were told, do not engage, fine. Came back and reported that to the regimental commander, and his answer was, hell, we'll starve him out. But that was the extent of my combat experience in World War II. Uh, I mentioned earlier that I did have a little combat experience, but not with the Japanese. We had two divisions on this one island, a place called Moritai, 93rd Division, and the 31st Division. 31st Division was a National Guard unit from the South, all white. 93rd Division is all black except for the division commander and two other, or three other people. But uh, when the division deactivated, soldiers who are officers who had sufficient combat time were sent home. I had a grand total of a few weeks in the combat zone. I went to a place called the Philippines, Manila, became a signal officer. Heavy construction, construction unit, putting in pole, pole line, cables, open wire. And my most interesting challenge there was we also put in poles for radio commercial stations, 100 foot poles, about 10 feet going to the ground, and the rest goes up above the ground. I hate heights. I don't like heights. But I had a unit, a platoon, that they love to climb up and down. Okay, and I'm a confident soldier that if my soldier could do something, I'm gonna do it. If you're going up 100 foot on a pole, it, it's challenging. I'm a paratrooper, but I don't like heights. I went up the pole, proved a point that I could do it and would do it. My soldiers were so happy to see me do it because the other 
Four platoons had platoon leaders, officers, who would never climb. But 19-year-old, what the hell, they can do. That's easy to do, just to impress them. That was one of the most challenging things I've ever done in my life. I will not back do it again. In Korea, I was fortunate enough to be on something called a competitive tour. I'm not too sure where that means anything to you, but when the Army wanted to get regular Army officers and they were not getting enough from the academies in ROTCs, they selected about 1,000 officers and had them compete against each other. And at the end of that competition, some were selected. I did my competitive tour in Korea, which was, by the way, against the regulation because it said once you start the tour, you finish your tour before you get to go anyplace else. I was at Fort Lewis when the Korean War broke out. The war required the division to go. We went. I came out of Korea with a couple of Purple Hearts, a couple of Silver Stars, and a few other minor things, but also with a healthy respect for what happens to people in command, in command and in combat. World War II was, um, by the time I came back from the Pacific, uh, the war had been over by a year and a half. So we're still celebrating. Coming back from Korea is a lot different because we were, quote, baby killers. We were doing other things that the public, uh, who did not want us to be in Korea. And in Vietnam, I said, I did not have the same experience. I could not wear a uniform. I was not encouraged to wear a uniform, say, in an airport from after Korea or even after Vietnam. I think it'd be a little silly to do that. Uh, I would also suggest that, think about the last time you saw a senior officer wearing a uniform in the airport, even to this day. It's not pleasant to come back and be cursed at, to be have your family abused because you happen to be a soldier. But we've overcome that now. Um, well, I guess, uh, can you uh, talk just briefly about your time after the service? Because you, you uh, had a lot of success in, um, after you got out of the military as well. Well, it depends on how you define success. I will give you in the order that they occur and then let you determine whether that is a success. My first job was in the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance in the Agency for International Development. We were the ones that responded to the government's request for providing assistance to a foreign government if they had humanitarian aid. My job was to identify those challenges and then preparing the report, the support that they needed. Uh, the biggest challenge was during the famine in Africa, where we had literally thousands of people sitting around starving. And food was being used as a weapon. Food would come into the port. The government would refuse to unload the ships. And therefore, the people starved. We set up an airline, an air shipment, to fly food to them so they could have it. That was a, not the kind of thing you like to think about, but that happened. Uh, other things, after the job in Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance, I became the director of something called FEMA, Federal Emergency Management Agency. FEMA has a responsibility for doing many things for our government, and very, we're very proud of what we did uh, everything from providing security for outside nuclear power plant 
and when I say providing security, we provide the coordination for the security. Uh, what happens inside the wire, that's national reconnaissance responsibility. We also had the responsibility for relocating the senior members of the government to a their ex place to go to run the government if the capital was blown up, as an example. We provide the transportation to get them to where they were going. One of the more interesting things, the Congress also had a place to go. And while we had the aircraft to move them, not many members were willing to do that because that meant leaving their families someplace else. We had the responsibility for civil defense, which is an old fashioned word from World War II, but that was our responsibility. Following FEMA, I went to a place called Prairie View A&M University, the school which I graduated from many years ago. I went back as a president, which was also a very challenging thing because some of the good civilian professors weren't anxious to see a soldier coming back down to run the place. Also, we are running, there was a ma major problem with money. In order to conserve the money, we had to make some significant changes to include suspend, suspend football for a year. Now, you're from Texas. You understand what that means when you suspend football for a year. If you haven't been burned in effigy, you haven't lived. Well, that happened to me. But we were able to recover the funds. No longer were there football scholarships. We went, after they came back, football came back, we set another record for the NCAA. We went eight years without winning a football game. Long after I left, they finally won a football game. I might add that they won the Southwest Athletic Conference a year after they won the first game. That was a challenging assignment too, being a president. We trained, first select officers and non-commissioned officers, trained, got in country, refreshed our training, and went off to fight the war. We were very successful. I will use an expression which is hard to define, good luck facing a god and a family, plus having outstanding soldiers. I'm happy, I'm happy to say some of them are here at the Fairfax. Mm 